really, I think it's a combination of uh, a lot of aspects in my childhood and education that led me to, to the science uh, world. I think initially the main, uh, the main interest I had uh, at some point in my childhood was to go to the university because I could see my oldest uh, sister going to the university. We have uh, quite some uh, difference of age and I understood that uh, at a rather adult age uh, one has a possibility to, in a way, kind of uh, remain in, in, in the type of school and also continue teaching and, uh, and do research by asking a lot of questions. And I was more interested in this approach, uh, which uh, for sure is very much associated to science. <laughs> so I think this is maybe the main point. And then after the interest to biology came, uh, came later. Maybe again a combination of, uh, of experiences. Uh, certainly a teacher of biology when I was 11, 12 years old must have, uh, must have raised my interest in, uh, in biology to a certain extent because when I joined the Pasteur Institute as a master's student and uh, I told my mother, okay, I, I chose a, a lab at the Pasteur Institute. She told me, oh, when you were 12 years old, you came back, around 12 years old, you came back from school and you said, one day I will work at the Pasteur Institute. But she never reminded me this. So I think, uh, yeah. And th there are some, uh, obviously, uh, you know, different types of experiences that must have, uh, after, conducted me to the world of science and specifically biology. I don't know actually why I, I, I chose uh, biology at some point. Again, it must have been uh, a, a gut feeling. I was hesitating between mathematics and, and biology. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, I decided to go to biology. I think maybe because I was interested always in, uh, in asking a lot of questions, or let's say I had a lot of questions with regard to to us as human beings confronted to diseases, confronted to not only uh, physical diseases, but also mental diseases. So uh, I've been always interested in uh, also in everything related to psychology, psychiatry. And then when you, when you start to understand uh, the biological world, and specifically when you start to understand the microbial world, you also understand that the microbes work quite much as, uh, you know, you find a lot of sociological aspects in the microbial world that are quite similar to, to our world, with, uh, you know, a lot of uh, aspects that are very similar. But for sure, there are microbes. They don't, uh, do not have a brain. They react differently. But this idea that they live in a society, uh, they have to adapt. <laughs> A uh, lot of aspects that are quite much or so related. And so I saw that in biology, one can nevertheless uh, ask more questions, that it's maybe more fruitful with regard to the idea of understanding uh, the world and understanding oneself. And it's also an experimental world. And I was also interested in, uh, in the fact that it's, it's an, there is an intellectual aspect, but there is a methodological and experimental aspect, and I was also interested in this. So I think the combination of everything led me more to biology. Yeah, obviously a biology teacher, uh, certainly, that I remember from when I was 11, 12 years old. I also remember actually a teacher in physics, um, two, three years later. And this teacher was important because uh, from this teacher, I remember the, the experimental work at the bench uh, that was also put forward in a, in a kind of enjoyable way. <laughs> and also working with, uh, you know, the other students. So understanding that this was not only uh, doing experiments on, on you know, on, on its own, but also, you know, communicating with uh, the others in the room to to, to make the experiment work and that it was also uh, an enjoyable and, and fun experience. It was a little bit out of, you know, uh, listening to a teacher uh, uh, stating, uh, you know, dogmas and facts. And I think this was maybe also uh, part of my interest in, uh, in the experimental science. 
So actually, doing research is <laughs> is is a lot about dealing with um, frustrations and failures. It's really part of being a researcher. Um, if it actually also part of the success of a researcher. Uh, I believe, at least in my case, I would not have been successful if I had not encountered a number of, of failures and frustrations. And actually, the CRISPR um, project in my lab really started by um, certainly dealing with frustrations of, of having discovered an RNA molecule that is essential for the CRISPR-Cas9 system that is called tracer RNA. And then when we identified this RNA molecule and uh, and we thought of, of the certain function of this RNA molecule not being able to make a sense of this function and mechanism. So it was by, you know, after two, three years of frustration, specifically from students who were doing the experiments, and then the idea to, to link this molecule to CRISPR, where, uh, again, you know, I had uh, difficulties to motivate a, a student who were working on, uh, on this, uh, this molecule to, to pursue and, and shift direction. So she didn't want to, to do it. And after a year, another student said, OK, I'm going to, to do the experiment you have to do because <laughs> you really insist a lot. And, and actually, it's also being ready to take you know, new ways and think differently out of the box. And, and in the case for CRISPR, was thinking out of the box for the tracer RNA molecule and also thinking out of the box for CRISPR, uh, mentioning that um, CRISPR research, uh, as much as uh, Nobel has awarded uh, the research on, on CRISPR-Cas9, it also involved a lot of pioneers, uh, excellent researchers who, who started to work on CRISPR that was unknown, started to understand what the CRISPR system was in bacteria, that it was an immune system against uh, viruses and other mobile genetic elements, uh, starting to understand certain mechanisms of CRISPR. And this is, you know, all this knowledge that allowed me as well to think, oh, it seems like and deal with uh, another type of CRISPR-Cas mechanism must be different. So it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of methodology and uh, yeah, it's a lot of failure. It's, it's part of being a researcher. Experiments uh, sometimes and very often fail technically. So we have to troubleshoot. It's a lot of troubleshooting. And then in the hypothesis or in the, the strategy and the methodology of what to do first, what to look at, it's a process. So it's always A, B, C, and then plan A, plan B, plan C, plan A1. For CRISPR, this was maybe the most uh, strategic uh, and effective uh, plans uh, uh, that I elaborated. And uh, so it was a lot of, you know, strategy, plan A, plan B, plan C, and A1, A2, and, uh, you know, going forward in this direction. Not being afraid of, of failures, otherwise one cannot be a researcher. As a researcher, but I guess it's maybe for, for everyone even who's not a researcher, one deals with a lot of barriers in, in life, right? Uh, specifically during a career path. Uh, specifically more being a woman, um, I guess I, I try to not really look too much into the fact that I was a woman, but rather uh, look into the fact that uh, uh, I am a scientist. And, and as a scientist, you, you have to encounter enough barriers already. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, um, I'm a woman in science, but I'm a, I've also been an international scientist. So this also, uh, let's say, uh, triggers maybe um, more barriers uh, because one has to, to deal with uh, yeah, um, another type of uh, you know, culture and uh, another type of environment um, that can be very fruitful, but can also lead to some you know, difficulties or some, let's say, more time for adaptation. Um, there are lots of women in science in our days. Um, the topic has uh, evolved uh, quite, um, quite dramatically the past, uh, you know, 30 years. Uh, we find more and more uh, women uh, studying science, more and more uh, women who uh, let's say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, decided to pursue uh, you know, a career in science. Um, the, the, the system has also facilitated more the access and uh, you know, a change of culture that would understand that uh, it's very interesting and it's very important to maintain diversity also within a faculty among the 
the professors and the group leaders, uh, because this is uh, an enrichment. Um, maybe it's not enough. Uh, the word is still quite uh, masculine. So, um, and the decisions are maybe uh, still taken a lot uh, by uh, researchers who are, uh, you know, men. Um, I hope it's going to evolve. I'm a bit concerned with the fact that it has evolved and for the past few years we tend to see more um, young female scientists having, um, let's say, not, um, I don't know if it's the courage, but let's say deciding to not pursue with a, a group leader position. So I hope that this is just a, a bad timing and that uh, there will be more in the future. But this is, uh, I guess, what we observed all over the world on other topics, and I hope that this will, uh, will raise. But as a researcher, one has enough buyers, enough. And also to mention very importantly, and I think this is good, you see a change also of culture in also the junior leaders who are men, because uh, this is now a new generation who wants to to integrate more time for the family. And this is not any longer a question for female scientists, but also for male scientists, who also are now confronted to uh, the issues that for sure research requires a lot of time, a lot of commitment, and that uh, one has to have it compatible with a family life. So it's interesting to see that all the problems that women had, it also become also problems of young male, uh, you know, group leaders, which I think it's good in a way because it shows an evolution of our society in uh, the right way. Yeah, I think uh, a message for the young female researcher would be to, to not think that, um, you know, uh, certain topics in life are, are just only for, for men, <laughs> I think. Uh, um, they have access in our days uh, to different types of science and I think uh, the infrastructure has facilitated a lot the integration of female scientists and international scientists. Uh, so I think they should uh, go for it, not be concerned by um, fears or, or you know, a lack of self-confidence. Uh, actually, I have worked also a lot with, with men and uh, often I was surprised to know to which extent they were actually like female scientists and they deal with the same issues, they just don't maybe express them the same way. Uh, but they deal also with frustrations, they deal also with um, sometimes a bit of a lack of self-confidence. They may tend to maybe um, express it differently or they are for sure raised in, in knowing that they have to show their self-confidence and the, the female, they are more prone to show, you know, a certain lack of self-confidence. But I think at the end of the day, I kind of understood that we are all sitting in the same boat. It's just the, the way to express that may be different. And I think it's important to encourage the young scientists to understand and the young females to say, no, we are all the same and, and they have to to get ways, and I think in our days they can be helped or so to be coached and to learn to, yeah, to, to deal with uh, maybe uh, certain, you know, traits that need to be improved for being a, a scientist. I think in our days you have also the possibility to have mentors, coaches who, who can accompany, you know, and make the journey uh, a little bit uh, easier and also to make the journey in the sense that, uh, you know, to, 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 to accompany the young scientists to, to say, yes, you, it, it's nice, uh, um, you know, a, a path in science and not focus really on the career, but just, you know, to be a scientist and, and evolve to then after become a group leader, not because it's a career, but because then after, I guess it's also our role to to then convey the science to the next generation and, and you know, and deal with a group. So it's, it's not a question of career, it's a question maybe of a natural path that is, you know, then you grow and, and you teach the science to other people and you convey the science to the younger generation and it's, uh, 
Yeah, and it's very nice. There are issues like for everything, but it's very nice. Yeah, so the general advice I give is always to listen to, to oneself. I think it's important to listen to oneself and follow uh, the gut feeling. Uh, follow um, the intuition and in research what is really important is to to let's say to, to follow what one likes to do so sometimes for sure I was also confronted sometimes that you know I liked different topics so it was difficult to choose but I think what helps a lot is just to enjoy what uh, you know the science and see um, you know to see what the science can, can really bring. So focus on, on this and uh, really trigger, try, try to trigger in oneself the sense of, of curiosity of what we like to do and, and the joy of, of the science. And this, it's important because it allows us to deal with the rest. And, um, and this is what I, I try to encourage. I think science is also, uh, it's also nice, it's enjoyable. You know, so they have to learn to all these aspects to 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 see this aspect and and see that the rest is are little steps that may work, not work perfectly, but that at the end of the day make the the beauty of this work that is very typical. We are very um, how do you say uh, privileged to be able to to ask questions and and work on what we like to to work. So this it's I think a very privileged situation. So to become a scientist, you need a number of qualities. Um, you need to be, to be patient, but yet uh, be impatient. <laughs> so it's a combination of both. Uh, you need to be curious, I think, uh, persistent. Um, you need to analyze very well. I mean, be methodologic. I think this is important. Be logic, have a, the right intuition, um, be curious. Uh, yeah, know how to deal with frustrations. And I have to say that in biology, it, it's also work. I mean, it's, I, I would say it's a little bit mathematic. Uh, the more experience one is doing, uh, the more uh, results you produce and, and, and uh, the more uh, chance you have to, to let's say, to, to maybe understand something uh, unique. So, and it's a lot of time with oneself to give uh, the time to really think properly, read, so no uh, acquire the knowledge, but also uh, enough time to take distance from the knowledge to be able to think out of the box and be creative. So I think what helps as well is to have some activities outside uh, you know, the work, but still it's a lot of work. So I think it's not really something from nine to five, because a typical scientist will, will work a lot, but, um, you know, in, in, typical scientists is not going to think uh, at a specific time. We'll think at different times. But it's really important also to bring some artistic activities, or I, or I would always uh, uh, mention uh, sportive activities, because the brain works a lot in the background. So one has to, to a little bit, you know, uh, have some activities that uh, uses the brain in a, in a different way. But in biology, it, it's, yeah, it's a lot of work. One has to be very committed. Criticizing, it's very important in research. And it's very important that, this, that you ask this question because um, an, a key or so for success for a researcher is to know how to accept criticism. It's, uh, we are constantly judged and we, our work is constantly criticized by our colleagues and peers and we have to deal with it. And a good way is to first, you know, self-criticizing oneself like this, we can deal more with the critics of the others, but it's like this that we go forward with our uh, new dogmas and, and new findings. Yes, because I was uh, studying piano and ballet dance. So ballet dance for a very long time until my nearly 30s. Uh, piano, uh, I stopped at 14, 15 years old. I started at six, seven. Um, I think this was very important for me because I think uh, I, I find in, in those artistic uh, 
uh, activities, quite much what we need as a scientist. It's a lot of repetition, a lot of methodology, uh, a lot of um, also, um, how do you say, one has to be uh, focused and concentrated and, and also, also hard on oneself, right? I mean, when you do a ballet dance, it's not always the easiest, I think, <laughs> physical activity. Uh, so I think it's very helpful to also deal with, with frustrations and you have creativity and also emotions in there, which I think you have also in science. Uh, I always had an interest in, uh, yeah, um, early on in the literature and that now it's been long years, I don't have really time to, to read the way I would like to read. So this, it's a little bit problematic with the life I'm, I'm having, or I read articles or, you know, news, but unfortunately less time to read books. So I hope in the future I can, uh, let's say, deal with, uh, with this frustration. But otherwise I've always been interested in culture and arts, thanks to my parents. And I think the ballet um, dance, you know, it's also quite physical as a matter of fact. And I realized recently that actually this was important for me. I had missed out on having a, a regular physical activity. So I'm doing a lot of sport and I think for me it's essential. I belong to the people who are more uh, effective while uh, moving and exercising. Uh, there are some people that need to be static, me, I need to move a lot. And <laughs> so I think this, it's, 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 uh, I think people are different, but you have a lot of scientists who are, actually I know a lot of scientists who are very active physically. It's very interesting because I believe that, <laughs> you know, you have different types of scientists, those who really need to move a lot to be creative and go, go in, a, in a productive way in their life as a scientist. What is very interesting in the CRISPR topic is that a lot of scientists from different fields actually got interested into CRISPR. So you had the pure um, bacteriologists, those who were working on viruses of bacteria, those working on enzymes, those working like me on, uh, on, uh, you know, on small RNA molecules and also in the past phages, structural biologists uh, like Jennifer Donner. So a lot of people came together to try to join forces to understand what CRISPR-Cas was about. And when we started to work on, on CRISPR-Cas9, we had a first collaboration uh, with an RNA group working on bacteria, the group of Jörg Vogel with Cynthia Sharma. And then a second collaboration with Jennifer Downey. It was at the time where, uh, the, let's say, the project needed more structural biology aspect. And so then after, as typical it is for collaboration, you have to meet the collaborators somewhere. So we met at a conference and I approached her. Uh, to ask her whether she was interested to, to uh, decipher the structure of the protein CRISPR-Cas9 because she was already working on other types of CRISPR-Cas systems. And then, you know, it's a kind of, um, like, I guess, for every collaboration, as it seems, as long as we are not forced to collaborate, which in general, we may be forced to collaborate thanks to a, a funding, but we find our collaborators. And in general, we try to find collaborators we, we think we will be able to work with because we don't know when we meet the person. And as a matter of fact here, it was a collaboration that was, uh, that was working well. Also because the younger scientists effectively doing the experiments were also, um, you know, enjoying to work together at distance. At the time we were using Skype. This is important, you know. You have the people doing the experiments in a collaboration. It does not work if only the principal investigators think that they can work together. Effectively, the work, the, the scientists doing the, the experimental work has also to come together. And this was the case. And even though the collaboration was very short, it was intense. But then after, um, because of, um, of the impact of, of the work, uh, we uh, very, very soon actually after um, we published the collaborative work, uh, we um, found ourselves participating in a lot of events uh, where we receive, uh, you know, awards or other type of, of events where we will uh, convey, uh, you know, the science uh, that, uh, um, that we had uh, done. And so this uh, meant that uh, this meant that uh, we had a, a lot of, of opportunities uh, to meet. And so, um, so over the past 10 years, we met uh, extremely often in, in different types of events. And this was maybe quite peculiar because of the real impact of the technology extremely fast. So we were finding ourselves in a lot of 
of events. So that, that was the, a very unique, I think, uh, maybe story. I mean, me, I was trained as a, as a biochemist, geneticist, uh, microbiologist, but uh, uh, we have the same way of approaching very um, precisely the research. And um, I think this we shared in common, also in common the fact that, you know, when you collaborate, um, you have for sure different types of scientists and us, we are really much, maybe because of the type of research that we are doing, uh, you know, we were, it was very important for us to approach the research in a, in a very precise way and to make sure that, uh, you know, the research will be done and, you know, really reproducible, etc. So this was also important to, to work with a scientist who has the same view. And uh, so this, and I have a lot of respect for her as a, as a scientist. <laughs> it is interesting, as a matter of fact, that the CRISPR-Cas technology has had an impact uh, on humankind actually quite fast. So it's a technology that is uh, explained as molecular scissors and that has the ability to edit uh, the genes and the expression of genes in uh, multiple cells on, uh, and organisms in a very precise manner, in an unprecedented way in the sense that uh, the tool allows to do precise genetics, but the tool can be programmed and designed in a, in a simpler way uh, compared to the tools that were available prior to CRISPR-Cas9. And it has had very, very fast, large implications in life sciences globally, in biotechnology, in medicine, and in research and development. And it has an impact on humankind in the sense that uh, beyond uh, the great, uh, um, um, how do you say, applicability of the, of the technology in, as a direct medicine, because it is now really being developed for curing uh, certain types of, of diseases, and we see the first uh, uh, cures uh, occurring to treat uh, human blood uh, genetic disorders. It has also a great impact in understanding uh, the mechanisms of life, which for sure uh, contribute to also lead to, you know, uh, the development of biotechnologies in, in general. Um, with also, you know, all the, the technologies that are used to to produce new types of biofuels or, or uh, also, um, um, how do you say, uh, request uh, a large number of technologies, including genetic technologies uh, for, you know, genetic engineering and, and uh, systems biology and so on and so forth. There are also great applications in, uh, so beyond the research and development in the clinical sector, in the biotechnology uh, sector, there are also great implications in, uh, in plant biology, in the production of plant crops, uh, specifically uh, in the world of uh, global warming and gloma, global climate change changes, the necessity to, to be able to engineer crops that can sustain uh, the changes that are meant to be encountered in the very near future and even long-term future. So, you know, we all, I guess, uh, in the life of today, we benefit so much of uh, a great well-being uh, thanks to a number of, uh, you know, technologies or so, um, you know, improvement of food and, and you know, and medicine and health and, and CRISPR-Cas has, has a great impact in this kind. That's why it has a, a, a really, uh, it impacts, uh, let's say, humankind. Yes, so um, very, very fast uh, I met certain uh, scientists <laughs> uh, who were extremely pleased to have this technology that would allow them to, to do uh, precise genetics in their cells and organisms of interest, which was not possible prior to CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, not to such, uh, let's say, democratic uh, fashion and, and uh, you know, easy um, way to design and also at low costs. And this, I saw it uh, very fast. And, uh, you know, um, w what is very interesting is that I still for sure meet scientists. So now after 10 years, I meet scientists who were not scientists 10 years ago and who thank me for having, uh, you know, given them the, the possibility to start science and to, to start projects asking questions they would not have been able to, to ask 
uh, prior to 10 years ago. Uh, I also um, receive, uh, you know, thanks from scientists who, who definitely can also answer questions they could not answer and that also uh, allow them to go to new ways or new, new directions in their research, which they were not anticipating prior to, to CRISPR-Cas9. Also some scientists who, who made their, their career, you know, following up on all the developments of the technologies that have been tremendous the past 10 years, with lots of scientists who became also famous themselves because, you know, they carry it on with uh, the development of the technology, allowing the technology to be used even further and uh, more precisely in, in certain subjects. Um, I never met, actually, uh, patients who uh, have been cured uh, with CRISPR-Cas9. There is a first patient who was uh, cured, actually, the first patient in Germany. Um, and, you know, for the sake of, let's say, um, you know, uh, the privacy <laughs> of the person, uh, I did not meet uh, the patient, but I think I have to say the, the greatest award for me uh, was most likely the, I mean, clearly, actually, the, the development of the technology uh, after, you know, seven years, uh, even less into a cure to treat uh, patients, uh, because um, I realized very fast to which extent there were a large number of patients in need. I uh, realized this because you receive requests of patients who are quite desperate and quite ready to, to try you know, any types of, of cure. They could try to, to uh, um, either for themselves or for uh, specifically kids with genetic disorders. So very alarming uh, requests. And it's here that one realizes the power of the technology. And um, also the fact that uh, this was, let's say, uh, a, a primary um, main application that I was wishing for the technology that I had anticipated that, uh, you know, it would be useful to treat human genetic disorders. So I'm uh, personally very happy to see it happening. But again, it's, it's here beyond the, the fundamental science. This is extremely important. Beyond the fundamental science, uh, there is, um, the development of the technology into applications. And this is also uh, associated to the reason why uh, Alfred Nobel created these prizes is, is really the applications. And we never thank enough uh, all the people who are developing and, and uh, you know, have to be very much uh, entrepreneurial to develop uh, further into applications the, the basic science. And, um, and I think this was a message of Alfred Nobel, so we often forget about those who, who are also doing science uh, and, and bring the technology forward for uh, good purposes, and I think they should also be thanked. And, and in the case of CRISPR, it's about uh, yeah, clinicians, developers who do a, a fantastic job. <laughs>